if you breach an MSP, you likely could get access to all of the customers that that MSP is managing. Uh, depending on how that MSP is running their operation, what type of uh, management tools they have in place, um, whether they've got, you know, super user rights through um, uh, MDM type software to all the endpoints of a particular company, uh, or they have the super user rights to any of the cloud SaaS apps that that uh, end client is using. Um, it gives a bad actor potentially uh, the keys to the kingdom across multiple customers at one entry point. So, you know, it only takes one failure of an MSP to potentially get access to multiple clients, let alone uh, multiple user endpoints within a client. Still today, the most common method is compromising someone's credentials. That's the low hanging fruit. Uh, hopefully today, most of them have got, you know, MFA at least put on the environments. Um, but CISA just this month issued a big statement saying you've got to move to phishing resistant MFA because of, you know, if there is a shareable secret, a knowable secret, something the user has to enter, there's a chance that a bad actor could try to trick someone into doing that. So at MSPs, depending on the size of the MSP, someone, you know, presenting themselves is up the food chain or even down the food chain within the environment says, hey, I need access to this. I need you to let me in. There's an emergency. This customer's got this and they get tricked into sharing uh, their access, whether that's got, you know, legacy MFA on it or not, because that's shareable. The other type of attack that we're seeing, you know, Microsoft, Twilio, Uber, all of them uh, were stuff were were beat by legacy MFA protocols. And one of those attacks was uh, at the Uber Uber breach was by MFA fatigue where, because it's a credential plus a accept decline push, um, you know, the bad actor just continues to send those in either hopes for an accidental acceptance or times it just right where the user is trying to get in. And uh, it was actually the bad actor trying to get in and they trick a person into accepting that, that push. There are other ways into the MSPs, but the, you know, Bad actors are lazy and they're going to take the path of least resistance, which is currently uh, the people are the easiest thing to trick and, and get in rather than trying to actually break encryption or hack a device. Uh, they're just going to trick the person and, and get in that way. If they're not putting appropriate things in place, yeah, there always can be liability. There's liability in any business, but um, if there was, and it really comes down to the contracts that the MSP is using, right? Between themselves and the, their end customers, et cetera, um, and their own insurance, right? So whether an MSP is carrying their, you know, whatever type of insurance they're carrying, um, what, are, what the customer's insurance is carrying. Now, what we do know about insurance is that, uh, let's say it's a, there's a, a customer gets breached. Uh, the insurance provider is the, going to be the one that's going to go investigate heavily because they never want to pay. And if they can find someone else that's liable, they're going to find it, right? So uh, we all know this from other environments, whether it's our auto insurance or whatever it is, the insurance companies investigate heavily to find a way not to pay. Um, and so whether it was the end customer didn't put best practices in place or the MSP didn't put best practices in place, or what a lot of MSPs are facing today is they actually need to get, you know, written statements that a particular customer declined implementing certain security controls because the insurance company would be like, well, you told them you were going to do this and you advertise it on your website that you're doing all these security things. Um, but what we're seeing is a lot of the end customers because legacy MFA is creates a lot of friction and frustration and all of those things that they don't want it turned on or they ask them to turn it back off, et cetera. So they ultimately end up, you know, with the scenario where they declined protection. Um, and if the MSP doesn't document that they, that the customer declined it, uh, the insurance provider is going to try to point the fingers elsewhere. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, 
you know, different avenues that the MSP is now open for liability and, and becoming more exposed. If there is any knowledge factor, right? If you have to know something and enter it as a user, then that's typically fishable, right? So um, if, if you are, until you're moving to something that is token-based, biometrically based, uh, behavioral biometric based in different areas to where you're moving away from anything that the user can have knowledge transfer of or has to enter or has to, um, you know, do that's based on any component of that being shareable, then that's typically a fishable process. Um, there are, you know, obviously there's different types of uh, phishing resistant MFA uh, out there. Uh, uh, Traitware is one of those um, in leading innovation in that space um, where it, we eliminate, you know, we're passwordless, so there's no password to share or to transfer or to loan out or have compromised or stolen. Uh, but beyond that, we deliver up to four factors of authentication that are completely transparent to the user, which means that they're unknown to the user. Uh, the technology is doing them. It's a, uh, the technology is rotating the keys, meaning instead of changing your password, the technology is doing that, uh, unbeknownst to the user. So there's never the ability for a bad actor to try to capture that because the user, the individual, the employee, even myself, I don't have anything like if you called me and tried to socially engineer me, I have nothing to share with you. Like I don't have, I can't share it with you or have it fish because it doesn't exist. MFA at account creation means that it's it's not an extra step, meaning like if you turn on a, a new hire, let's say you hire a new employee or whatever it is, and you have to create their identity for the applications that that person's going to use in their job, right? So let's say they've got access to your email, whether that's Google Workspace or Office 365, et cetera, or, you know, your Slack tools or you know, Zoom or Ring Central or Teams or whatever it is for their collaboration tools, those applications, you have to create accounts for them, license seats, et cetera. In normal practice today, you would create a username and a password and then have to corral them into adding a, a 2FA or legacy style MFA as a second step, meaning a second process for the administrator as well as the user, they have to go back and pair each one of those accounts with a um, authenticator. Now, what we've seen is this big growth in single sign-on so that uh, they, uh, an admin can stick those applications between, behind single sign-on like Okta or Azure SSO, uh, Ping, Fordrock, et cetera. The issue with that is still username, password, and a legacy 2FA for most of those use case scenarios. Um, and then now they've got one point of failure to all those applications, kind of like why the bad actor attacks the MSP uh, for one point of entry to all the customers. SSO brings one point of entry to all of the applications if you stick those things in there and kind of moves you away from segmented access controls uh, in certain areas. Now, we believe SSO is great if done properly. We provide SSO uh, if, you know, in, in the right environments. We also believe there's a time and place for segmented access controls, meaning certain applications, privilege access, users, et cetera, should have segmented access to those environments. Uh, the key in doing this, and your question was around MFA at account creation, is how do you deploy multi-factor authentication in, in a single step for the admins and a single step for the user and have it always on, meaning it's not based on conditional access and, oh, well, they're at an unknown IP address, I need to enforce MFA now. Again, that's a convenience-based policy. A lot of the reasons that conditional access things were set is because they wanted to make it easier for the users if they were in a trusted environment, meaning you're at work you're on works IP address, you only need to enter a password and no extra steps to reduce friction for the user versus making something that is frictionless, you know, consumer 
upgrade, easy to use, simplified access that has the MFA natively or inherently on all the time. There's no option to not use it. A simple way to think about it is uh, MFA at account creation means that the user gets MFA without having to do anything, any extra steps, like it's just done. When you create their account, they've got multi-factor authentication and they don't even know it. It's 70% of the users within the Azure environment are not using strong multi-factor authentication. Well, and, it, and they're on a mission to, to achieve 100% coverage. They're still only at 30% adoption rate. And a big part of that is that it's really difficult for the admins and really difficult for the users to use it. Um, and, it and, it's, and it's not done at that account creation where it's not an option, right? Basically, MFA should not be an option anymore. It should just be on when you create a user, period.